okay, wow, this is one hell of a differential equation. And although the task at hand seems pretty daunting, we can simplify the structure here quite nicely because the differential equation in front of us is expressed completely in terms of the derivatives of y with respect to x. So the only terms we have are the derivatives. And that means we can perform a nice substitution that will simplify our structure considerably. And that substitution is letting dy by dx equal to u. Now, this implies that d2y by dx squared equals du by dx. And using the chain rule, we can convert this entire problem in the world of derivatives of y with respect to x into a new world of derivatives of the new variable with respect to the old variable y. So using the chain rule, you can write du by dx as du by dy times dy by dx, and dy by dx is just your u variable, right? So this implies that d2y by dx squared equals u times du by dy. So that's one transformation and another transformation. However, we still have to deal with the third derivative of y with respect to x. So d3y by dx cubed is the derivative with respect to x of the second derivative of y with respect to x, correct? And using our newfound structure in the u world, we can write this as the derivative with respect to x of u times du by dy. And again, using the chain rule, you can write this as the derivative of u times du by dy with respect to y times dy by dx, correct? And dy by dx is again our familiar u variable. So taking the derivative, evaluating the derivative here using the product rule, we're gonna have uh, du by dy times du by dy, right? So that's du uh, by dy squared plus u times the second derivative of u with respect to y, and all of this is being multiplied by this u term. So that's how the third derivative transforms. And notice that we've just lost one order of the derivative. We, we now no longer have to deal with the third derivative of y with respect to x because we've converted it into, uh, we've transformed it into a structure involving the second derivative and the first derivative of our new variable u. So with our knowledge of how the derivatives transform in the new u world, we can translate our differential equation now. So we have dy by dx, so that is the u variable times the third derivative. So the third derivative, uh, sorry about that, notice that it also has a factor of u being multiplied. So you have u times u, so that's u squared, times the structure here, du by dy squared, plus u times d2u by dy squared, and you have this plus the first derivative squared, so that's plus u squared, and this equals twice the second derivative squared, so that's two times u squared times uh, du by dy squared. Okay, that is pretty nice. And if you divide both sides by u squared, you can simplify matters, but bear in mind that you lose the solution u equals zero, which is pretty trivial. I mean, u being equal to zero means that dy by dx equals zero, so y is just a constant. So you lose that solution uh, in, during uh, the current solution development. Okay, cool, but again, that's trivial, so no problems. So we have some nice cancellations taking place and a much more simple structure, I believe. So this is a plus one now, and this is two times the first derivative squared. And now just for some rearrangement, you can subtract both sides uh, using this term and also using a one. So this implies that you have u times d2u by dy squared being equal to, now there's only one of these first derivative squared left terms. So you have du by dy squared minus one, which is a considerably nicer structure than the one we started with. And it's still nonlinear, but again, 
we're, we're only having to deal with the derivatives of u with respect to y. So we can repeat our substitution. We can let du by dy equal to s, which implies that the second derivative of u with respect to y equals ds by dy. And again, using the chain rule to express the higher derivatives in terms of derivatives of the new variable with respect to the old variable. So we have ds by du times du by dy, and du by dy is just our s variable, correct? So we have s times du by dy being the second derivative of u with respect to y. Okay, cool. So this makes our job quite simple, in fact because you have u times the second derivative, which is s times ds by du, and this equals uh, du by dy is just s squared, right? So you have s squared minus one. This is, uh, this is just, <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, you have this separable differential equation now. It's a first order separable differential equation that is just so damn easy to solve. So this implies that you have one by s squared minus one ds being equal to one by u du and performing the integration. Wait, wait, I forgot this factor of s, which is of course essential to integration. So you have one half here, a two here. So this means that you have one half of the logarithm of s squared minus one being one uh, being equal to the logarithm of u plus the logarithm of some positive constant c. So if you multiply both sides by 2 and exponentiate, then you have this nice structure of the absolute value of s squared minus 1 being equal to log u squared. So you can ditch the absolute value sign. Oh, sorry about that. We exponentiated as well. So you have u squared, right, once you multiply by 2 and use the properties of the logarithm. So you can ditch the absolute value sign and you have this c squared term as well. The absolute valued operator here, we have two equations to deal with. One is s squared minus one being equal to positive u squared times c squared and the other is negative u squared times c squared. So this implies that s squared equals one plus or minus u squared times c squared and making use of the square root we have s being equal to the positive or the negative square root of one plus or minus u squared times c squared. Now, the good news is that this outer plus or minus sign doesn't have much effect on our integrations because all we have to do is remember to uh, write down both solutions, one for the plus sign outside and one for the negative sign outside. However, it's the plus or minus sign inside the radical that matter because they result in completely different integrations, right? They result in completely different structures for antiderivatives. So this is pretty cool. We can have, we're going to evaluate here. I'm just going to ignore the plus or minus sign outside because again, it's not that much material. So I'm going to have to perform two integrations here. One for s being equal to 1 plus u squared times c squared and the other for s being equal to 1 minus u squared times c squared. So let's turn our attention here first. And s was of course du by dy, correct? So this is again a nice first order separable differential equation. And we have du by 1 plus u squared c squared and the square root on the left dy on the right and integrating using the respective variables on either side. Uh, we're going to need a factor of c here. So the left is just the inverse cinch function. So we have 1 by c inverse cinch of u times c being equal to y plus another constant of integration called that c prime. Multiplying both sides by c, that gives us c times y and c prime c that I'm going to be calling another constant b. So this implies that u equals 1 by c times the cinch of c y plus b. And once this is clear, it's pretty obvious that this, uh, this structure, this equation, of du by dy being equal to the square root of 1 minus u squared times c squared will result in an inverse sine function. So 
pretty much exactly the same structure, but with a sine function on the right. So the other equation sorts out to u being equal to 1 by c times the sine of c y plus b. So again, we're going to deal with this one first, and let me switch back to the yellow color to symbolize it. u was in fact dy by dx, right? So dy by dx equals 1 by c cinch of c y plus b. Again, a separable first order differential equation. So we have c times the hyperbolic cosecant of cy plus b on the left, dy, of course, and this is dx, integrating using the respective variables. Okay, cool. So we have c times, what is the antiderivative of the hyperbolic cosecant function? Well, it's the logarithm of the hyperbolic tangent. So we have log hyperbolic tangent cy plus b, and we already had this factor of c outside, so yeah, no need to divide by c, because even if you do the cancel out, whatever, you get the point. Uh, cy plus b divided by 2, that's the antiderivative for the right-hand side, and this equals x plus another constant of integration, let's call it a. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to leave it in this form, and for the sine version of the answer, I'm going to have log um, cosecant, right? Cosecant minus cotangent. So it's cosecant cy plus b minus cotangent cy plus b. If I remember correctly, this equals x plus that constant a. So there you have it. These are the solutions to our differential equation. And of course, there were some plus and minus sign thingies to deal with. So yeah, uh, to deal with those negative signs, just add the plus or minus signs here. So that concludes today's video. I hope you enjoyed the solution development. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.